，尤尔根·史密特·霍巴，计算机科学家，欧洲科学与艺术院院士 ，LSTM 网络发明人，瑞士达勒莫尔人工智能研究所联合主任。自十五岁起，他就立志创造一个比他自己更聪明、能自我学习的 AI 机器，然后圆满退休。其突出成就 ，LSTM 深度神经网络为机器学习领域带来了革命性变化。到2017年，以其为基础的应用软件已安装在三十亿部智能手机上，用于 Google、Facebook 的语音识别、翻译软件、苹果 Siri、亚马逊的 Alexa 智能助手等，每天被使用数十亿次。它还是无监督对抗网络。人工好奇心和原学习模型机技术的先行者，他在二零一三年获国际神经网络学会海姆霍兹奖，二零一六年获 i t r i p l e 计算机智能学会的神经网络先驱奖。好的，下面呢，我们就有请约根教授来做这个演讲。I wish to, I wish to thank the organizer. Invitation to give a keynote here. It's a great honor. What you see behind me is a cartoon that I made for my little website on AI against the coronavirus just a few days ago, and much of what I'm going to tell you will be reflected in this website. Artificial intelligence, based on deep neural networks and deep learning, can help to fight. The COVID-19 virus in many ways. The basic principle is very simple: neural networks can learn to detect patterns in data from viruses, patients, others, and we can use those neural networks then to predict future consequences of possible actions, and we will act to minimize damage. And I'll mention a few examples. One can track populations through pattern recognition. Many of you probably know the Bluetooth peer-to-peer、uh, -peer apps on your smartphone,、uh, which allow you to prevent dangerous contacts to a certain extent. Not so much AI is needed for that. It is more challenging to recognize faces or gates of people. Uh, and their contacts in videos taken by drones or in the street. That's harder, but it's possible. And the ways of doing that actually go back a long time. In 2011, almost a decade ago, my brilliant postdoc Dan Girejan was the first to、um, to create a deep and fast neural network, which was able to win. Pattern recognition competitions, and back then, a decade ago, for the first time, superhuman performance in computer vision was achieved in a contest in Silicon Valley. And much of modern computer vision is extending this approach. And especially in China, it's widely used today. Neural networks can also learn to predict outbreaks to build early warning systems, and there is a Kaggle COVID-19 forecasting challenge on that. And neural networks can also learn to predict future demand for limited resources such as ventilators and doctors to optimize logistics. And you can call that predictive maintenance of the population, if you will. One can also sequence viral genomes. That's what's being done all the time, and predict where similar genomes are going to appear next. Because maybe you know that the virus genome is mutating all the time randomly, and that's how you can trace it back in time where it's coming from. And that that data can be fed into AI systems that then learn to predict the future evolution, future expected evolution of these observations. Neural networks can also learn to monitor single patients. For example, they can monitor your heart rate, and they can、uh, track your biosignals, your breathing, your coughs, and 
other signals. And my little website that I mentioned before has a bunch of references on recent applications of this to the coronavirus crisis. And neural networks can also analyze uh, images, such as X-ray images of uh, lungs or chests of patients, and they can diagnose pathologies. And again, my website has a bunch of references on that. By the way, the first medical imaging contest won by deep neural networks dates back to 2012. And again, it was my postdoc, Dan Girezan, and his colleagues and my little team. And this was on cancer detection. What you see behind me is a picture of the slice through a female breast. And some of these cells that you see there are harmless and others are dangerous. And normally it takes a trained histologist to tell the good ones from the bad ones. But in this contest, uh, we were able to teach a neural network to imitate the histologist. And that's how the system suddenly was able to outperform all these competitors. And today everybody is doing this, not only startups, but also the big companies such as Siemens and Google and IBM. This actually was part of our recent decade of deep learning. Between 2010 and 2020, computers suddenly were fast enough to allow commercial applications of all these techniques that we have developed a long time ago. And uh, much of that actually goes back to the early 90s. And I'm always um, claiming that we had this miraculous year in the, uh, the, the year 1990 to 1991, when many of the basic concepts that have become very popular later uh, were published for the first time, but computers were a million times slower than today, and nobody could do much with that. And this has greatly changed. Neural networks can also partially automate drug design, and I find this very exciting. For example, neural networks can help to find molecules that dock on the folded proteins of this virus. The virus is simple. It has just a few um, proteins, and the goal must be to inhibit the activity of these proteins, much like antibodies do, such that um, you can block the entire self-replication machinery of the virus. And already in 2007, when compute was almost 1,000 times more expensive than today, the deep neural network called Long Short-Term Memory, or LSTM, excelled at predicting protein folding. And this was done by my former student, but now a professor in Linz, Sepp Hochreiter, in 2007. And to predict folding like that is important for finding docking stations. Google DeepMind recently also had computational predictions of protein structures associated with the virus. By the way, the first DeepMinders with publications in AI and PhDs in computer science actually came from my little lab here in Switzerland. One of them was co-founder of the company and the other one the first employee. So what's this LSTM, which I just mentioned, which has been so successful in predicting the folding of proteins in 2007? It's much older than 2007. It goes back also um, to the early 90s, and it's a neural network, a recurrent neural network, a little bit inspired by the human brain. In the human brain, you've got um, maybe 100 billion little processors called neurons, and each of them is connected to maybe 10,000 other neurons. And some of these input, some of these neurons are input neurons where data is coming through the cameras and the microphones. And some of these neurons are output neurons and if they are switched on, then your finger muscles move or your speech muscles move. And your life is basically about translating these incoming inputs into actions, action sequences that lead to success. 
Now, all these connections have a little strength, and it's called the weight. And in the beginning, all of these weights are random, which means that the influence that one neuron onto another has is random too. But then through learning, some of these connections get stronger and some of them get weaker, such that in the end, the network can learn to do something interesting just by uh, following training examples. For example, it can drive a car or do speech recognition and stuff like that, or predict coronavirus folding, all kinds of things like that. And um, I don't have the time to go into the details of that. However, at least I can mention in the slide behind me the names of the brilliant students in my lab that have made, them, that, have made that possible. First of all, Sepp Hochreiter, my first student ever. Already in 1991, he had fundamental insights uh, in his diploma thesis. And then Felix Geers, uh, in, in my Swiss uh, lab already, not any longer at uh, Tech University Munich. And then Alex Graves, a Scottish guy who uh, also had great contributions. Dan Wierstra, Justin Bayer, and a couple of other important students who, who made LSTM what it is today. And what is this used for today? You don't know it so much from protein folding prediction. No, you know it from your smartphone because you have an LSTM on your, on your smartphone where it is doing much of the AI applications there. For example, speech recognition. Uh, since 2015, whenever you um, uh, interact with a search engine through the voice channel, when you say, okay, Google, what is the shortest way to the station? Then it understands what you say and it translates that into a query for the search engine. And it's much better than what they had before. And today that's on billions of smartphones. And also, um, shortly after that, um, LSTM started to become really useful for translating from one language into another. And this is now also on many, many smartphones. By 2017, Facebook Translate already did about uh, 30 billion translations of messages through LSTM per week. 30 billion. If you compare that to the most successful YouTube video that has about 6 billion clicks, but it needed two years for that. So LSTM is useful for many uh, kinds of sequence processing. Protein folding is just one of these possible applications. However, back then, 2000, um, uh, 1991, when we started with this whole deep learning thing for recurrent networks, um, we could do only little toy experiments because computers were really a million times slower than they are today. Fortunately, however, every five years, computing became 10 times cheaper. And that's an old trend. It was even old in 1990 because it started at least way back in 1941 when this man, Konrad Zuse, built the first working program control general computer. That was between 1935 and 1941. And he, he could do roughly one operation per second. One operation per second, like a, a single multiplication per second. But then 30 years later, you could do roughly one million operations like that for the same price and so on. And today we can do roughly 1 million billion operations per second for the same price. And suddenly um, computers and smartphones and everything are powerful enough to, um, to really exploit the power of these old algorithms from the previous millennium. By 2009, Computers were fast enough such for the first time uh, LSTM was able to win uh, pattern recognition competitions. Through the efforts of my previously mentioned PhD student Alex Graves. And, um, and then came our decade of deep learning where suddenly everybody started to use that. Which makes me happy. It's really um, great to see that decades of research have eventually led to something that really influences 
billions of people all over the world and currently really can play a role in find, fighting the coronavirus. One can also teach chemistry to LSTM or to feed forward neural networks or to graph neural networks, uh, which were pioneered in 1995 by Goller and Küchler, the graph neural networks. How does that work? You have input substances and certain conditions such as temperature and catalyzers, and then a chemical reaction takes place and it produces outputs, output substances. And if you have a database with millions of examples like that, the network can learn to map these input ingredients to the corresponding output substances. And in the process, it learns about chemistry. And you can use it as a stand-in for what physics and chemistry really do. Which means you can, once you have trained it on lots of examples, once you have made it a, an artificial chemist, you can use it to uh, come up with new uh, compositions of ingredients to achieve new output substances that you never have seen in this way. For example, you have certain desired properties of the output substances and then you can um, work the neural network backwards and figure out which kind of input substances do I need, given this model of chemistry, to achieve these desired results. And the jaws of chemical engineers dropped when they saw how well this can work. In recent years, this really has started to revolutionize chemistry. And neural networks are now sometimes even good enough to replace wet lab tests, the so-called assays. Neural networks won already eight years ago the Merck Molecular Activity Challenge. That was done by the University of Toronto. And uh, they also won the TOX21 data challenge on predicting the toxicity of substances. That was done by the University of Linz in uh, Hochreiter's group. Neural networks can design new molecules. Uh, for example, Segler and colleagues had a famous paper about that in 2018. And they also can find the antibody needle in an antibody repertoire haystack. That was again done by the University of Linz, which has a very strong bioinformatics group, which is using deep learning in many ways to, um, to improve the situation in chemistry, in um, drug design, and so on. For example, the ligand-based approach goes like this. Given a certain molecule, a neural network learns to predict to which proteins it will bind. Again, done by the University of Linz. And my uh, little website, AI versus COVID-19, has references on that. The typical drug discovery development pipeline takes too long. It takes at least six years for selecting maybe five out of 10,000 compounds. And it takes seven years of clinical trials afterwards um, where you then study just a few things that are very promising, and then it still takes one year or more of approval. And that's too long, especially at um, the times of the current pandemic. But one can speed this up by fast virtual screening. Use a large database, such as the Zinc database, which contains descriptions of maybe one billion molecules and then pipes the data through a deep neural network called the SMILES LSTM. The SMILES LSTM, which also goes back to the University of Linz. And it suggested about 30,000 top scoring molecules as inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2, of this virus. And then once you have this greatly um, reduced set of candidates, you start testing in the wet lab. And you can also apply this approach to drugs which are already on the market, which is important because that's the way to reduce these costly clinical trials. Just a few days ago, there was the JEDI challenge on that, 
on the 9th of April 2020, this grand challenge started, which is called a billion molecules against COVID-19. And there's 2 million euros price money on this. Jedi calls itself the European Moonshot Factory. And that's one of the first moonshots that they have there. Again, my little website, AI versus COVID, has links to many additional resources to help with COVID-19 research. Most of what I have been talking about so far is about supervised learning. However, we also have methods that don't slavishly imitate human teachers, but that create their own goals and that curiously explore the world like little babies do, like little scientists do. Little babies are little scientists and and they don't learn much from their parents. A little bit they learn from the parents, but much of what they learn is learned by inventing experiments with the toys. How do I um, change the inputs that are coming in through my actions in the real world? And that's how little babies learn by playing to understand gravity and other aspects of physics and so on. And since 1990, we've been working on uh, little artificial agents that really create their own experiments, self-invented experiments to create situations in the world from which they can learn something that they didn't know yet. So the basics of curious little babies are the same, the same principles that we find in scientists 20 years later. And the only difference is that the experiments are becoming more expensive. And we have artificial scientists that are getting smarter and smarter in this way. And it may be too late uh, for the coronavirus, which needs a very fast response. But the future is going to be about artificial scientists that creatively and curiously learn about the world by inventing their own goals and their own experiments. And in principle, we already know how to do that. Many people want to know how does COVID-19 affect the economy? And I should know because I have a startup called Nascent, which is affected because our clients are affected. Um, all the major companies in the world, all the famous uh, manufacturers of all kinds of devices are affected. However, as all the Chinese know well, a crisis is also an opportunity. And actually, the industry is going to emerge stronger from this crisis than it was before. Because the machines that they are using are going to become smarter and they will be able to do all kinds of things that they couldn't do before using artificial brains like the ones that we are constructing at Nasens. Nasens is pronounced like birth in English, like Nasens, but it's spelled in a different way. NN for neural networks, AI for artificial intelligence, and it's, it's about the birth of a general purpose neural network-based artificial intelligence. Here are uh, some pictures taken with the guys that are collaborating with us in uh, several exciting projects, Audi, uh, Festo, and its robot hands, EOS, which is a leader in 3D manufacturing and 3D industrial uh, printing, SHOT, which is a leader in making glass, and maybe you have their glass in the lenses of your smartphones because they are owned by the Zeiss Foundation. And Sulza Schmid, which is using drones to inspect wind turbines without endangering any humans in the process. Let me finally emphasize that AI is for all. AI is not going to be dominated by just a few big companies. No, it's getting cheaper 
all the time. Every five years, it's getting 10 times cheaper, as I mentioned before, which means within 30 years, it's going to be a million times cheaper. It's going to make human lives longer and healthier and happier, and it has already started doing that. I remember 40 years ago, I had a rich friend. He owned a Porsche. But the most amazing thing was that in the Porsche, he had a mobile phone, which means he could talk to other guys who also had a Porsche like that while being on the road. It was the most incredible thing. Today, a few decades later, billions of people, also in developing countries, have smartphones that are much better than what he had back then. And the same is going to be true for AI. Everybody is going to have cheap AIs making his life better in many different ways. So in the end, all will be good. I started this talk with a cartoon of a robot and I will end it with the cartoon of a robot which I drew a long time ago, 33 years ago one third of a century ago. You see it behind me. It's the cover of my diploma thesis from 1987. My diploma thesis was very ambitious. It was about building a machine that not only learns, but also learns to improve the way it learns, and learns to improve the way it learns, to improve the way it learns, and so on recursively. Meta-learning, this is called. And back then, few people were interested, but today it's a hot topic. And in many ways, it has defined my life since then. Thank you very much for your patience. Will we the privilege? Okay. 好，我们的这个非常感谢 Yuan 的精彩演讲啊。我们接下来进入 Q&A 的环节。Now we move to the Q&A session. 呃，在场的这个嘉宾有没有直接的问题？可以直接跟这个 y o g a n 来交互啊。啊 y o g a n you need to turn on your video. Yes, I seem to have video. Can't you see me? Oh yes, I can also. Yeah, y o g a n please. Hey, hello everybody. I'm happy to take any. Hi, Yogan. So this is Jie Tang from Tsinghua. So we have some email conversation. Yeah. So yeah, I know that you 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 are the father of the long short term, uh, the LSTM. So, but it, but it, for the future, probably I know that you are working also on some kind of cognitive, like a cognitive AI. So, what do you think about the cognition? How to implement the cognition using deep learning or neural networks? Or what's the future direction about that? Yeah. Well. Um... The future will be about systems that learn to identify abstract objects in the incoming data, like what babies do and what you do. And they are going to learn to predict what's going to happen if they do something. And they are not only going to predict the pixels that are changing, but they will realize, oh, there are these high-level objects such, such as um, people and chairs and beds and whatever. And um, the reason they will learn to identify these objects is because if you um, extract from the raw pixel stream um, spatial, spatial temporal abstractions, um, then suddenly reasoning is going to be easier because you don't, for example, uh, you, you have apples falling from a tree. And all the apples, they accelerate in the same way. And there's a simple abstraction behind that, which is the law of gravity, which you can extract. If you look at all these orange pixels that are coming down uh, as the apples are falling from the tree, you, um, you realize, well, you cannot predict every single pixel and every single reflection. However, there is something um, 
like this orange blob in many of these pixels can be more or less predicted because there is this object, the apple, which is coming down. And uh, the good way of representing that is to cre create an internal representation which you can manipulate in many ways. For example, you in a different context you may say, let's take this apple and uh, throw it and make a weapon out of it, uh, such that um, we have a long distance uh, influence. Hello? And Hello, yes. So our, our um, uh, future AIs are going to, to learn stuff like that. And they are going to use artificial curiosity for learning that. Um, they are going to create, like little babies, their own uh, experiments that lead to inputs from which they still can learn something that they didn't know. And we already have had uh, stuff like that for 30 years, but now it's really getting very concrete and very, um, uh, um, very well understood, um, also thanks to faster computers. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, maybe I can follow the question. Uh, so uh, for a baby, in fact, uh, he or she can do, can learn, can study, can explore the world. The basic reason is that the baby has a brain. So for, for our AI system, so basically you need uh, a very maybe complicated neural network to learn. So LSTM is very cool, very powerful, and uh, very popular nowadays. But maybe we need new neural network for the future to learn to uh, for, for nowadays, the artificial neural network, uh, basically not, uh, for example, not spiking neural network like our, our brain. So how about your opinion for the next generation neural network? Uh, spiking neural network or maybe totally new uh, other structures, uh, artificial uh, neural network. Can you give some directions for that? The LSTM is basically a very simple supervised learning mechanism. So it's not enough for um, reinforcement learning and for uh, artificial curiosity and the other things I mentioned before. Yes, you can use it for reinforcement learning using uh, video games, for example, and maybe you have seen uh, OpenAI and DeepMind had systems that learn to play um, video games, StarCraft, and Dota, using an LSTM, basically, which uh, is not trained by people by learning, but by reinforcement learning. However, um, what you really want to see is more, slightly more complex systems that are not just uh, monolithic uh, single networks, but where you have at least two systems. One is a prediction machine, which could be an LSTM, which learns to predict what's going to happen as a consequence of the actions of the first network, of the, of the, act, of the controller that is executing actions that will have an influence on the world. And as you are learning to become a better predictor, the predictor can be used for planning. Millisecond by millisecond planning is the easiest way of doing that. That's why we had 30 years ago when you also had two networks and one of them learned to be a model of the world and the other one, the controller, learn to use the model of the network to predict different futures and then choose a future and a, a sequence of actions that led to high predicted reward. And um, all of that has to, has to be um, mm, rethought in a more um, sophisticated way because what we had back then was really just this millisecond by millisecond planning. And when I go from here to Beijing, I'm not using millisecond by millisecond planning of all these possible actions. No, I'm using the cognitive approach that you mentioned. I say, hmm, I have to decompose my task into a couple of sub goals. I, first, I have to go to the taxi station. And then um, from there, I go to the airport. And at the airport, I enter the plane. And then for nine hours, nothing happens. And, um, and then in Beijing, I exit which means I have decomposed this big problem into lots of little chunks which are based on previously acquired knowledge. And to learn to compose these high-level chunks, um, that is something that our current systems cannot do well yet. However, I think we already understand in many ways how we can uh, 
change them and modify them such that they can think in terms of these spatial temporal abstractions. And I think that is going to be the future. For, for the temporal and the spatial uh, information, the world is, is the source of any intelligence. So we need the train the machine to explore the, the dynamic world. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, you again. I don't know if you remember me. So yeah. two years ago, we have we have dinner in Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah. You again, go online. Yeah. So one more talk. I actually like it as as sharp as you gave a few years ago. Actually. So uh, I have a question. So uh, right now, I really know the power of LSTM and all the structured natural and uh, neural net, neural network model. So people now talk about how to explain those models, how to explain the outcome of these models. So for this point of view, do you have any idea how we explain what ASTM is doing? So can we convert the structure of ASTM to the structure of the language? Yeah. Yes, um, it has already been done to a certain extent. Um, uh, as you, um, I'm sure you know that well, um, Microsoft and, and, um, uh, and Google and Amazon and Baidu and uh, the great Chinese companies are using uh, LSTMs to translate, uh, to uh, learn about language and then translate from one language into another. But um, what's still missing at the moment at least is um, what we know about language, because we relate our model of language to the real world. When we see a sentence that says, the cat fell from the tree, if it's just the text, uh, then we have a very limited uh, information about what's happening. However, we also have a video where a cat is falling from the tree, or if we have 100 um, videos where cats are falling from trees, and then at the same time, we a speech signal, which, uh, Says, and now they're falling from the tree, then suddenly our learning system, our learning network, can associate these different things and it can learn how um, language relates to the objects in the real world. And yes, in the videos, you get only pixels and they change in a certain way, but the system, in principle, already today, to a certain extent, can learn to associate these changes in the pixel stream with these high level objects, such as the cat or the concept of falling and the concept of acceleration as gravity is um, pulling the cat towards the ground and so on. And, and so um, all of this higher level knowledge um, is necessary to really understand language well and to the extent that our future systems are going to ex um, understand these high level relations between the low level pixels and the high level abstractions in language, um, they are going to be better translator and, um, the, uh, translators and they are going to be better um, writers of stories and they are going to be better analyzers of existing stories and so on. So basically, you see, if you uh, connect the, uh, the text to other modality of signals, like video, it maybe give you better uh, supporting or grounded uh, knowledge or grounded support evidence to better understand the text. So uh, that's what would be great. But that also means you have to build a lot of a data set or have a lot of unsupervised learning method to do that. Yes, and the most exciting um, way of unsupervised learning, in my point of view, is this active unsupervised learning, which we also have started 30 years ago, but which is now really becoming uh, popular, where, where you don't just take the data that somebody else gives you, like somebody else gives you 100 videos of falling cats, and then he says, and the cat is falling from the tree, and the cat is falling from the tree. No, you, you let the system collect its own data, just like a baby does. Huh? Because how does a baby learn about falling objects? It takes objects, its toys, and then at some point it uh, sees, oh, if I open my hand, the thing will fall to the ground, and it's always going to fall in the same way. It's all, the objects are always accelerating in the same way, and it's trying to predict what's happening next. And, and the very first really simple system along these lines in 1990 was very simple. You had just two networks, and one of them is generating the actions that okay. lead to the changes of the uh, incoming videos and the incoming objects uh, and, and the incoming data, which, which are 
change because of the consequences of your actions. And the other one is just trying to predict these consequences. So you have two networks. One is trying to minimize its prediction error. The other one is trying to maximize the same error that the uh, predictor is minimizing. So you have this fight between two adversarial systems 30 years ago. And now suddenly, the first guy, the controller, is motivated to execute action sequences to invent experiments that lead to data where the second guy is still bad, where the model of the world still can learn to predict something that it didn't know. So you have this fight between two networks. And, um, and today, this concept has become really popular. And you can really use it in reinforcement learning uh, to um, improve uh, the, the artificial curiosity of the system, which, which, which you want to direct to the few things that it doesn't know yet. You don't want to repeat stuff again and again, which it already knows well. No, you always want to go to the limit of uh, to the thin line, the thin border between uh, what you already know and what you don't know yet. And artificial curiosity is about extending this border a little bit, such that you know a little bit more about the environment that you didn't know before. And um, and this whole artificial curiosity is about goal-directed exploration like that. And, um, and I think there has been uh, quite some progress in recent years along these lines, and we will see much more. So active learning, uh, artificial curiosity um, through systems that invent their own experiments to acquire the data that they need to better understand how the world works. Yeah, those active learning usually, you know, is not very efficient. You need, sometimes you need a human involved, or sometimes you need some uh, additional module to judge you know, which direction is going to move forward for the active learning. So how do you solve that one? I think uh, active learning, the idea is great, but usually uh, you have to, uh, to know which next stage you should actively on, right? So that one is not automated. So that's what be an issue usually. I don't know if there's a better solution to do that. Yes and no, I completely agree. Uh, so what you be usually have, look at a baby. A baby has two sources of um, knowledge. One are the parents who are di directing the uh, baby a little bit, and they give reward to the baby for achieving certain goals. But most of the time, most of the time, the baby doesn't care for the parents. It's just playing around with its toys, inventing new experiments, like a little physicist who learns by um, executing experiments how the world reacts and um, how the video changes when you rotate the toy and all of these things. And that's what these babies learn without their parents. So most of what they learn is about learning without the parents, but occasionally the parents come in and say, huh, but now you look, baby, you will get a lot of reward if you do that. And that's how you can shape um, the, the, um, the development of the system in a way that is compatible with your goals. So yes, most of the time, self-invented goals, which then can be reused, so the solution strategies that it found for the self-invented goals can be reused to uh, more quickly solve externally given goals. Because in the end, you want this little uh, artificial agent to work for you and to solve your problems. And so you have to shape and push it into this direction. Cool, yeah. Well, I think, okay, thank you very much. I probably will leave some more time to other my colleagues to ask your questions. Yeah, I appreciate your answer. I do, I do have one last, uh, last comment. I think machine is much less efficient than baby to take a supervision signal. I mean, when parents teach, when parents teach anything to the baby, maybe one time or two times the baby will learn it. But the machine, you know, it takes many, many times to actually learn from the supervision. Well, hopefully we're improving that part. But anyway, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we, we have the last uh, question. We just have the time for last question. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Uh, dear Jürgen, do you think English speaking scholars are more likely to be influ influential? <laughs> if yes, how to change it for we non native English speakers? <laughs> scholars, I, 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 I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so if you look, look at the history of science, there always has been some um, uh, dominant language, you know, for example, uh, 500 years ago, 400, 300 years ago, the scientists published in Latin, which goes back to the old Romans. And then um, uh, around 1870 to 1940 or something like that, 
the main language was German. And then after the Second World War, the main language of science became English. But now look at what's happening in China. There are now more scientists in China than in, other, um, in, in any other country in the world. And so the only reasonable prediction is that Chinese is going to become more important and more important. And who knows what will be the next language of science. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's time for the session. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thanks, Jürgen. 好的, Thank you, Jürgen. 呃, 非常感谢 Jürgen 教授啊, 我们这个演讲, 非常精彩的演讲, 还有很好的这个QA的这个分享 呃, Jürgen 教授呢, 讲的这个内容特别符合我们大会的这个主题啊我们因为是下一个十年我们正好是二零二零年无论是中国、美国、欧洲、日本、是吧，甚至非洲、南美洲的其他国家啊，呃，学者能有更好的这个呃交流和被大家看到、听到的机会啊，这是我们接下来的这个努力的方向。